Good morning to, uh, to everyone watching. My name is Pravini Baburam. I am a program manager at ECHO, Expertise Center for Diversity Policy, and it is my honor and pleasure to uh, moderate this coming panel with uh, Professor Isabel Menezes. Um, we have about 30 minutes for um, Professor Menezes' uh, keynote, and then afterwards we have about 30 minutes for a Q&A. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Isabel Menezes, um, Professor of Education at the Faculty of Psychology and Education Sciences of the University of Porto in Portugal, where she serves as head of the Department of Education and as director of the Center for Research and Intervention in Education. And Professor Menezes will discuss welcoming place, epistemic and relational diversity universities as universities. So Professor Menezes, uh, welcome again. And we look forward to your keynote. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Pravini, and thanks the organization of the I Belong project for the invitation to be here, and particularly, of course, the Porto team, the University of Porto team, and my colleague Sofia Marques da Silva. Um, I'm sharing uh, the, um, the screen for a presentation that I will hopefully try to do this. Uh, on the 30 minutes that we, we have proposed. So let me just start by saying one thing. When I speak of university, and I will speak of universities indiscriminately uh, as something that is a synonym to higher education institutions. So I'm not taking to, into account in a talk about diversity of the diversities of uh, organizations of higher education institutions. So please take it as the same thing. And I will try to do uh, basically three things, so four if you want uh, in this talk. The first is to start to discuss the role of universities as communities within communities. I will do this based on an ecological situated perspective of universities and trying to argue that this matters because it's helped us see universities as grounded and in place. A, a discussion that follows, I think, the, the argument that was, was being uh, put forward in the previous uh, uh, symposium. Uh, I also want to emphasize uh, the obvious growth in diversity in universities. In the last 50 years, it is undisputable that there's been an increase in diversity, but this has also generated a growing inclusion and a growing exclusion inside universities. And we must obviously discuss this also. And finally, I will try to uh, based on uh, research that we have done with students in uh, some European countries, we are going to present some data and based on this arc for the need for a whole school, whole society approach towards diversity that really uh, embraces pluralism and diversity as a plus, not as a minus, as an, an advantage for us all in universities, not as a benefits for the few. And with this, I will try to arc following Achille Mbembe's discussion for the need for a critical cosmopolitan pluriversity as the future of universities. So let me start by the basic question, what is a university? I will ask the, this question more than once. Um, well, and, and it's also important to state that many times we ask ourselves these questions, but we, of course, ask them as this, as if this was something very new, that we are now facing these challenges that are very typical of our times and that nobody in the past has dealt with these challenges. And this is why I particularly like this quote from William Chage back in the 20s. He was a rector of a state university in the United States. And what he was discussing is what is the role of the state university? And for him, the role of the state university, and it's incredibly 
incredible how it resonates with our vision of universities still today, is that university should be or should have as a central idea the service to the community where it is in place. Uh, the state university he has involves taking into account the relationship between the state and the citizens and links together these things and takes into account the life of the community itself. This for him implies putting in practice the social responsibility of universities. And for him, this means three different things that I wanted to emphasize here. The first is a, an idea of an inclusive university in terms of academic areas. What Shades was arguing is that there is no knowledge that is of interest to the community that should be left out of the university. And this is, I think, a very interesting perspective in the sense that no knowledge should be left out of the university in itself as long as it's relevant to the community. The second thing is inclusive and diverse in terms of students. Students from the community, wherever they come from, they should be included in the university. They should have a place in the university. And the third thing that is emphasizing is the need for universities besides developing scientific knowledge, academic knowledge, professional knowledge should also be concerned with forming what he calls public-minded alumni. What he is arguing is the need for students through the experience of university, being able to develop a concern for society as a whole, a concern for the way things work, or if you want in more classical terms these days, a critical citizenship that will allow them to question politics, society, the, the ways of the world. And I, I really think that this resonates, of course, very well with this idea of a socially responsive university. And we have witnessed in the last decades almost like a recreation of this uh, notion that universities must be socially responsible emphasizing exactly inclusion, social justice, and citizenship. And you have a lot of topics that come on uh, attached to this discussion, diversity, the environment, community development, fighting racism, promoting gender equality, emphasizing transparency. And this, in a way, are also traditional concerns with the roles and places of university that are recurrent uh, across time. However, it is also true that one must be aware of apparently positive and unambiguous concepts, that concepts that make it impossible for us to disagree. Can anyone be against social responsibility or inclusion or citizenship? Is it possible to be against these things? And the problem with these very positive expressions of positive goals or positive concepts is that they generally don't recognize or don't acknowledge that there is in an inevitable conflictual nature that social problems always involve. The problems that we are facing here are problems of severe inequality, discrimination, injustice, and sometimes oppression. And these problems are not solved by the remedial approaches that uh, some uh, argue as the best towards university social responsibility. In fact, these problems imply advocating for a real social change. And this is, I think, where universities as powerful institutions should be looking both internally and externally. And finally, of course, this illusion of a consensus 
also implies that many times there is a lack of a political reading that obviously calls our attention to the fact, I'm, I'm resting here on Ignacio Martin Baró, that if we, if we are disregarding the well-being of the most in favor of the well-being of the less, if we are overvaluing the interest of the few, then we are contributing to the dehumanization of a soul. And it is the quality of the democratic life of universities and societies that is at stake here. So let me go further. Why is an ecological situated view of higher education institutions important in this? Why does it matter? And in my view, it matters because it sees people and contexts as indissociable. It emphasizes the importance of networks between human and non-human entities. It emphasizes that meaning making is a contextual phenomena that you can only understand knowledge because it is situated in these networks of human and non-human entities where you interact on a daily basis. And this implies that in order for change to occur, you must have into account local definitions of problems, local resources, but also local hopes for change. And this implies developing collaborative and empowering relationships across the university. So let me try to make this a little bit more clearer in our vision of universities. And what I'm trying to depict here is the history of a single university like this light pink here, where you have a specific university. It has uh, students, it has staff, it has professors, it has departments, eventually schools, it has a curricula, it has degrees. And this particular university exists in this network of more proximal influences with the families of students, with the schools the students come from, with the local government, with other national higher education institutions, with the companies and non-governmental organizations and the unions. And these interactions help frame the life, the climate within the university. But you also, have other levels of influence, the national governments, in spite of the fact that the European higher education area is today very important in regulating higher education in Europe, it's also true that the national government continues to issue important regulations on the way things work inside universities. So the life of universities, the life of students here is also strongly influenced by regulations issued by the national governments. The higher education uh, international associations, such as, for instance, the European um, University Association that discuss the roles universities should have in terms of inclusions, but you also have international organizations such as the UNESCO or the Council of Europe that sometimes uh, discuss what the role of universities should be. And of course, you have other higher education institutions. And in relation to this, you have here relations that are of competition sometimes for a position in the rankings, or in other cases, a cooperation between this, um, these organizations. And all of this implies that across time, you have the influence of how higher education roles and identities change, how they are conceived and discussed, and how you can, in a way, uh, configurate what higher education means. If we want, and these are the flags that I'm trying. I'm very bad at making designs. I'm sorry for this. But these this flags 
try to depict what Foucault would call the mathesis, where all of this happens. So you have the myth of excellence. No university in this planet now says the, anything else, but that they are striving for excellence. They want to be excellent. Um, what excellent means is of course uh, another discussion, a, a discussion that in fact, nobody wants to uh, start or to begin because of course, as we all know, the devil is in the details always. But you also have regulations, for instance, on what is this idea of research, teach, teaching and the third mission? What is social responsibility and how it is framed, how it is now important in articulation, for instance, with the sustainable development goals that universities should care for. But this also happens in a context of a growing individualization and hyperconsumption of contemporary societies with an emphasis on transparency and accountability that comes together with a strong sense of distrust, risk, insecurity. And all of these are in fact things that were uh, in a way even made clearer by the pandemic, how all of this have challenged universities, but also contribute to the need for dealing with risk uh, and uh, questioning whether or not universities are prepared or if we need to look for other institutions that should take care of knowledge anyway. So what, what I'm arguing here is that you cannot discuss life here at this pink, at this light pink circle without taking into account these various levels of influence that help frame how life in this pink circle occurs. And again, what is a university? And I, I particularly like this photo of a demonstration in Marseille where the students are saying, la fac est à nous, université pour tout. And what they are saying, of course, is the faculty is ours, university for all. And they are reminding us that universities are many things and are from many people. Universities are a place to live, to teach and learn, of course, but also a social community where we develop as your project surely underlies a strong sense of belonging, but it's also an economic community where you deal daily with inequalities, with the access to scholarships or lack of funds. It's also a political community where you have uh, opportunities to participate, opportunities to voice, to representation, a part of the city, of a, a geographical location that is of importance. And of course, a personal place to which you develop attachment and memories that will accompany you throughout the entire, your entire life. However, as always, please beware of the we myth in the sense that communities are not homogeneous beings. Communities involve diversity, conflict, and dissent. And in just one university, there are many universities. So what does diversity mean in higher education? I particularly enjoyed this, this paper by Teichler uh, that discusses diversity in its various meanings. So diversity of institutional formats, organizational formats, of disciplines, of degrees, of reputation, but also diversity of population, which is our main issue here. And it concludes that it is true that not only the number of students in higher education has raised very significant in the last 50 years, but in Europe, and particularly in Europe, the, in the last eight years, and he was writing this in 2015, the number of 
uh, students coming from outside of Europe in higher education institutions doubled. So there's a significantly increase of diversity, particularly at the master level at post-graduation. Here, what I was trying to understand is, okay, but what is the actual diversity and how does it concern uh, institutions? And so I'm resting here on two European projects that the first um, was a survey of 159 higher education institutions across Europe, not across the European Union, across Europe. And they try to understand if several dimensions of diversity were, were addressed in relation to students, to academic staff and non-academic staff, and whether universities had some kind of regulations or concerns or policies in relation to this. And you have here disability and gender, almost at the top. Then you have ethnic, cultural migration background and socioeconomic background uh, at the second place. Then you have sexual identity, educational background. Uh, for slightly more than half, you have caring responsibilities and religious backgrounds or belief. And age, curiously, is at the lower side of uh, the list. The Euro student is uh, a regular survey of students, in this case, 28 European countries, again, not European Union countries, European countries. Uh, and it has performed a survey with uh, more than 1,300,000 uh, students. And interesting results, I think. Half of the students are younger than 25. The female students tend to be the majority in, in most countries, but there is a strong imbalance in ICT. Only 20% of the students have small children. In 40% of the countries, more than 20% of the students have a migration background. There's a huge variation in terms of access to disabled students that range from seven to 39%. Most students depend on public students' uh, support or self-earned income. Between one-fourth and three-fourths of students are the first generation in higher education, and most students come from averagely well-off families. What this is telling you is a, it's like a bottle that you look at the middle. You can look at this saying, okay, there's quite a huge diversity, but this also tells you that there's a lot to be done for this to be representative of the communities where these universities are located. And what we, we tried to do in a, in a previous project was to understand the literature in relation to this uh, issue of diversity and uh, dealing with diversity in higher education and we try to understand a little bit how this works, how research tells you that this works. And what basically we, we identified is that you must look at structural conditions. And it's interesting because I think this connects quite well with some of the proposals for action that the I Belong project is, is, being, is making and pre presenting in this in this symposium in this uh, webinar the structural conditions have to do with things that are um, related to entrance at the university and are determinant for access to university but have to do with personal experience like for instance social demographic characteristics or the quality the quality of secondary schools uh, an individual attended, and these are important factors. And in some cases, you can 
intervene at this level. Then you have a lot of educational and social policies, higher education policies, entrance prerequisites that could be more inclusive or more exclusive in terms of access to diverse students. But you also have general policies regarding diversity in the community that might support or not uh, students from this, this background. And you have a, a cultural and political dynamics where issues of inclusion, critical race perspectives, globalization can make a difference in terms of the structural conditions that influence the higher education experience. And as someone was saying just now in the previous discussion, the higher education experience of students involves educational experiences, but also involves the organizational context and policies. So universities have specific structures, policies and practices that might support or not the experience of diverse students. And also, the values, the mission, and the culture of the university can be more supportive, more embracing, more valuing of diversity and pluralism, or in some cases uh, could be, even if not in an open manner, could be um, discussing this and could be um, undermining opportunities for diversity. And then, of course, you have the educational experiences in the classroom, but also out of class with, for instance, community projects, other curricular experiences, but also the sense of belonging, the relational climate that implies the relations you establish with your peers, with your, with your uh, uh, colleagues, but also with the staff. All of this can be of importance to the to the experience of higher education. And the higher the diversity of this experience, there are also individual and societal outcomes that are very important. And that result, for instance, in higher levels of academic and professional success, uh, emphasis on social inclusion, but also the quality of democracy itself. And this is why not only the structural conditions contribute to the higher education experience and to individual and societal outcomes, but structural conditions contribute to individual and societal outcomes. And this, in fact, can influence the structural conditions to begin with. So if you want, this could be a virtuous cycle of higher education inclusion that cannot but include the, a strong need for redistribution, recognition, and representation. And I'm resting here, of course, on Nancy Fraser's uh, discussion in relation to this. So it's only not all, only a question of recognizing the needs, but also of redistributing policies that will help redistributing access to higher education in fairer ways, and also guaranteeing that there are opportunities for voice, for having a say uh, in the experience of the university itself. And I'm very briefly, I'm trying to, I'm coming to the conclusion of, of what I wanted to share. I'm resting here on the students' visions from interviews that we have done. Uh, and one strong tendency is the the balance that goes from a mission to a single negative story that students are many times confronted. I'm not represented in any place, this student says. I feel like the lecturers uh, keep talking about the third world as every disaster or disasters seem to be coming from there or merely because I come from the X place people allow themselves to assume they know who I am. And this tendency, for instance, that they, people are constantly highlighting, in this case, it was the ethnic background, the diversity, the being exotic, uh, the feeling that you really do not belong there. And this 
is expressed in sometimes subtle and sometimes very uh, overt ways. This other study is a study with adult mature students in higher education. And it's very interesting in these interviews because the, the first feeling, uh, and it was not a request of the, of the I belong team, but the first feeling is the feeling that I made it. The first thing I did was buying a t-shirt with the logo of the university and the faculty. I made it and I kept looking at it in my wardrobe. So every time this needs to feel that I really belong, I, I managed to get a place in this university. But then the feelings of being an alien in a strange place also emerge. I'm always lost, this woman says. Every week I feel lost. I come very rarely to the faculty. I, not, I never know in which room the class is going to take place. I am a little disappointed because I think the university is not ready to receive adults. We are thrown into a cage full of lion, lions and then it's every man for himself. The little time I'm here is like, I do not belong. I'm just an alien who landed here. And when faced with uh, uh, difficulties in progressing or succeeding, then it's my problem. I did not manage to organize my life. The self-blame that comes with these experiences is really disturbing and should really challenge us to try to do different things. Uh, the first thing, of course, that this quote is emphasizing is that you have to open up universities to difference and pluralism. Without difference, it's hard to know what you need to change. So you must be confronted with the difference inside to understand what you need to change in order to be more welcoming of this diversity. Then take people's, in this case is the perspective of black people, but take actually people into account. Giving them space for representation means that they have a voice and this voice should be heard and you should take it seriously. So this is obviously an extremely important thing. And finally, of course, it is not a matter of creating a university program. It is a matter of the heart of the resident's hospitality. It's not something that you can theorize about. It's about actual behaviors, attitudes, and ways of treating the newcomers that show this respect and welcoming experience. And so to complete, maybe we should strive for a pluriversity where we are all exotic selves, where we all maybe do not belong, but we cannot continue to um, not recognize that students feel uh, and face strong structural disadvantages in terms of access, but also in terms of progression. And this is something that is negative, not only for diverse students, but for us all. The learning climate for all the students should consider the opportunities to interact. We are more plural, a more diverse, um, climate that values diversity in the student body, in the staff body, and of course, in the teaching body. So the idea that the openness to change implies also the various levels of the university. And of course, we need a more dialogical perspective, but we cannot be fooled by an illusion of symmetry. There are asymmetries of power between the diverse groups that occupy higher education. And so we must consider diversity within diversity or if, and intersectionality if you want really to take this um, change into account. And finally, the idea or the call that I'm using here, Achille Membes, to, to conclude the need 
to decolonize the university that that really takes implies taking into account knowledge productive production as something that is more situated more articulated with the communities that come to the university and more open to this critical cosmopolitan vision that instead of thinking that we are dealing with a university is in fact uh, we are creating this pluriversity. Thank you. Thank you That's so much. Time. Yes, no, for sure. Thank you so much, Professor Isabel Menezes. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have gained a lot of food for thought, so we appreciate your, your contribution. And I have already seen some questions um, in the chat, so we'll make sure to, to address those. Um, so let me start with the first question that was posted. What are the changes that universities need to go through to achieve a real interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary contribution to the community? <laughs> I think a big question, but looking forward to your thoughts. It's a big question, no? Um, and with the thing with big questions is I don't think there is uh, one answer. This is something that each university must address in its own community. So one consequence of, of stating that we are uh, dealing with an ecological situated view, it's that each university should discuss this and should discuss this in uh, interaction with the actors and participants of its own community. And I think that, well, of course, this map shows you that there are things that universities can do. And I think that many of the, the discussion that you will have, that you had this morning and you continue to have in the afternoon shows that there are things that could be done. And sometimes it's things that are very simple, that can be transferable, but then the, how they are transferred exactly, the possibility for success also includes that you are not only transferring, you are translating in the sense that you, that you are uh, creating new meanings for this particular uh, practice that you felt was very interesting. And, and look, things that are being presented here are really, I think, interesting things that could be translatable into other contexts. But this idea that universities can do this insight, but I also think that universities are powerful institutions. And this means they also have the responsibility to arg for societal changes in this domain. They should complain uh, and they should advocate for more diversity for policies that support diversity in higher education institutions. So I think there are things to do within and things to do outside. Yes, thank you so much. So um, I also hear you say that in that sense, there's not only a diversity of um, student population, but also a diversity in approaches to um, tackling those questions. And at the same time, there's a, a, a communal uh, responsibility to engage um, society with those questions as mm -hmm. an institution that has a position of power. Yeah. That's, uh, is there anything? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's uh, uh, also good, you know, for, for a lot of uh, people. We're always, I think, especially in higher education, we're always looking for maybe you know, uh, formulas or, you know, the, the magic, uh, the magic bullet, <laughs> when really uh, diversity means that different things will work in different places and that it's up to us to kind of figure that out. But look, one thing I think it's important, and well, this also has to do with educational intervention, social intervention, community intervention, we know this. We learn a lot by looking at what other people are doing. We learn a lot by sharing practices. I particularly do not like the idea of good practices because, or even worse, best practices, something that you can just use in spite of contextual, uh, uh, well, special uh, characteristics. Yeah. But you learn a lot from what is 
what is being developed. You learn a lot um, from what, among others, this project has produced. And you learn not only because of the specifics of what they've done in the way they have done it, but also because of the process they have yeah. used in doing it. And I think that this transference, this translation is even more important sometimes. So this idea that it's not that I'm arguing that people, uh, what can be done in one university cannot be done in, in the other university, on the contrary, but it's important that we also take into account the specifics of the context, the, the communities, the people that are involved there. So it's a balance between being inspired by the practices and being able also to adapt, to be flexible, to co-create. It's really a process of co-creation where you get inspired, you learn from the experience of other colleagues, but you also try to reinvent in a way what, what it was being done. And the most important elements of what is being done, the core, is I think more transferable than sometimes the other elements of this. Yeah, so it's not so much about what they're doing, but how and how that relates to your context. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And how they do it and who are they involving? What processes did, did they manage to, to well, to, in, to guarantee the involvement of people? What were the elements that were really important for uh, this to become a successful uh, or empowering experience for the students involved. Yeah, thank you. I see a question in, in the chat. Um, I'm not sure uh, if it's uh, by now already explained. The one question is, can you explain your objection to the term good practice again, please? This term mm. is used a lot <laughs> in my context. So perhaps you want to <laughs> clarify I, that. I, I know, I know. Uh, um, to be honest, I tend to use interesting practice, which is a very, uh, I know it's, it's, it's interesting, but the thing of interesting is that it's, a, it's, it's sometimes difficult for people to understand what I'm trying to say. My problem with good practice is that you, and Please note, I've been involved in many projects when the result is producing uh, good practices. The problem with good practices is that you many times you decontextualize this idea of what is good. What is good in one context can be really um, not adequate in another context. So this idea that you can uh, make a, a, a just I've, this was used here and I'm going to do exactly the same thing there without taking into account the specifics, the interactions, the relations, the cultural meanings of that particular context is a risk in my opinion. So I tend to avoid the expression good practice because it, in a way it suggests that, well, you can use this everywhere because it's going to work. And I think that everyone works in, in educational, social and community intervention knows as well as I, that you always have to translate. You always have to transfer what is transferable. And this implies in some cases, major adaptation. Again, you transfer or you translate the core, but not what is in the periphery of the, of the project, because yeah. that's, many times specific to the context. Yeah, I, I, uh, I hope that's clear also for the one who posed the question. And I, I love the alternative of interesting uh, practice, which invites people then to explore, you know, what that means in, in their context. Exactly. Um, I see another question in the chat. It says, it was mentioned rec misrecognition. In Portugal, universities will start receiving more students from vocational courses how should universities prepare themselves to the opportunity of having students from a track upon which fall stereotypes? Thank you for that question. Um, I think that uh, the 
prejudice that university, prejudice and ignorance, to, to be honest, that, that universities have on the whole in Portugal in relation to this particular group of students, it's shown on the, on the fact that last year, which was the first time this could be uh, use this strategy could be used and and I'm here I'm talking about universities not polytechnic institutes I'm talking about universities there was not one single university who opened up the opportunity this means that universities are um, ignorant of the structure of the education system below university or beyond university in the sense that the assumption is that the students with a vocational, uh, from vocational tracks are less prepared. And this is so, uh, to, to be honest, so silly because as, as every student, the first thing is to make generalizations is always a problem. And the second problem is to assume that this is a, um, a format that is applied to all, a single formula that explains everything. It's never the case. So it, as always, it depends in the sense that it might be that some of the more theoretical um, contents that are emphasized, more emphasized in more academic tracks are less present. And this means that you will need to adapt. The second thing is to say that there are things particularly in relation to more applied knowledge where the students would probably excel in comparison with the, with the more academic tracks. And I think the defensive reaction of universities in Portugal in relation to this opportunity was really silly. And I, I, I really have to say embarrassing uh, to those of us working in education because it shows the ignorance and the inability to be open to change, to be open to diversity, and to be open to recognize this as an important opportunity. Does this imply that we have to change in, in, in the way we do things? Yes, but that's life and we change every time. So the, the thing that, uh, of course, we have to be attentive to the experience of the students, we have to understand whether or not the way we are doing things is adequate towards the students. But I think, to be honest, that this is also an opportunity for us to start looking a lot in Portuguese universities. I'm talking here of Portuguese universities where you have um, high rates of dropout in the first year in, in various courses. So in various degrees, in various areas. So maybe we are not looking well to incoming students. And if the fact that we are now opening up to students from vocational courses uh, also calls our attention to the need to look more closely to the experience of new incoming students, maybe this is a good thing for all. Again, a good thing for all, a good thing where we will learn from all. Because it's, it's true that in some cases you have a high rate of dropout and you have to look more closely why this is happening. And I think this, this is also a very important, a very important uh, contribution that opening up to vocational courses might bring. Thank you, Professor Mendes. We Thank have you, six you. minutes left before we have to wrap up and there are a few more questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going, I think a lot of overlap. So what I'll do is, um, I think there are three remaining questions. I'll share those questions and then I'll, I'll leave it up to you uh, to see how you can uh, respond. So uh, one of the question is, uh, what uh, may higher education institutions do to actually include the diverse diversities of students that are nowadays attending higher education? How can students be retained and drop out prevented? That's one question. Uh, the second question is, should we and how do we bring civic education to higher education? In most U EU countries, civic education subject ends in high school and is not a separate topic at higher education. 
And then finally, uh, the final question that I uh, can share is um, what uh, key dimensions uh, of excellence uh, would you address, would address a sense of belongingness in higher education, uh, which is uh, in relation to understanding or lack thereof of the myth of excellence in higher education institutions? Mm -hmm. So these are the questions, and I'll leave it up to you for, for your final reflections um, for this okay. session. So thank you so much. And thank you also for the questions before, but which were, of course, very interesting and thought-provoking. And um, to ask me how excellence articulates with sense of belonging, it's also thought-provoking. But, but it's true. But it's true, I must admit, that... Um, as more and more the um, emphasis on this uh, third dimension, the social dimension of education is becoming, is appearing as a legitimate part of excellence. It means also that now you have rankings in terms of uh, sustainable development goals in, in universities. And, and this also shows how excellence, the myth of excellence is incorporating elements that of course we might use. So uh, I would be in any case very careful uh, because I think that excellence tells little about uh, how things are done. Um, and it relates more sometimes to a, um, a marketing uh, perspective than real change in universities. But I think that it's also important to recognize that people or, or discourses about excellence also are incorporating social dimensions. And this can be work in our favor as long as we keep our eyes on the ball and we keep a critical perspective on this mythology in terms of we are all excellent universities without explaining very well what this means. Thank you. Second thing, the, the thing of uh, how can we prevent, um, how can we ensure that representation um, implies and even recognition uh, involves um, an acceptance and a support of students inside universities. I, I feel actually that this is this is a, a very important thing, and I, I maybe I, I would go back to one of the the, the speeches uh, where one of the students says that you you must invo involve students themselves in discussing how this can be done. The thing is, in universities, um, sometimes you are very concerned, what do I do, what do I do, what do I have to do? And sometimes it's more important to ask and to listen than to imagine what, what should be done. So this idea of actually listening to what these students are feeling, actually trying to understand how this process of inclusion exclusion are being generated is probably more important than to um, imagine that this will be a good strategy. I think that we must go back to the people, to the students themselves to understand a little bit more their experience, how they change from buying the t-shirt to feeling that they are doing all wrong and they, they must leave it to another to another time. And, and this, because this also implies a lot of suffering and I think that we must still and be open to the expression of this suffering and so that we can be better in addressing and preventing this process. But for me, the answer would be ask them, ask them, listen to what they're saying. And I think this is the main thing. Finally, the civic education. As you know, many times now we talk about citizenship and there's a lot of discussion nowadays in, in about global citizenship in higher education, whether or not it should be a specific 
subject or and, and it is also a discussion in in basic and secondary education in fact it's it's always a problem uh, of course if you want my honest answer i i don't think that civic education or citizenship education or if you allow me political education is already at university when a professor in his classroom says oh uh, um, where do you come from? And he makes a, a comment to where the student comes from, uh, or he re reacts in a particular way, or he says, no, no, well, you, I have nothing to learn from people from that particular country. This is political education in action. And this is more important, to be honest, than to have a separate course on civic or citizenship education. However, I do agree that we should have spaces in the university. I would not say a, a course, but open spaces for discussion about these things. It, to be honest, as a professor for many years, what I feel is that while in some uh, subjects it's, well, uh, easy to create an environment for a discussion, I also feel that we must have places. It could be extracurricular stuff. It could be based on uh, cinema, um, viewing a film, discussing, having a community project, service learning, whatever. But I think that we must increase our ability to make a dis an explicit discussion about these things because otherwise, what happens is that students come to university and go, they succeed, they complete, they go to their life and we fail in forming those public minded alumni that Chase was arguing. And I think that in order for us to do this, we must create a diversity of opportunities for them to experience pluralism, diversity, also inside their own uh, classes their own degrees. And this is more transversal, I think, that's purely creating a subject that you have to have with three ECTS and you do this and it's done. Because it's more, it should be more embedded in the whole experience of what it means to be in a pluriversity. Thank you. But thank you so much for the question. Very interesting. Thank you so much for your um, insightful reflections. I think uh, also particularly your your uh, concluding remark on basically everything's political, right? And, and we just have to acknowledge yeah. that and also create space to, uh, to reflect critically uh, on that. So um, with that concluding remark, I want to thank you once again for uh, being with us here today and to everyone watching, also for sharing your questions. Um, we'll wrap up this part of um, the program. And if I'm not mistaken, um, it's time for lunch. Um, so um, not sure what this means for, for this live stream, but um, whoever is um, moderating the rest of the session, I'm handing it back uh, to you. Thank you again, Professor Menezes. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>